The Unshackled Waves, episode 132. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was a pretty turbulent week in Australian politics. Michael McCormack was elected National Party Leader and Deputy Prime Minister. Bill Shorten's duplicity on the Adani coal mine and workplace laws were exposed, but thanks to the Turnbull government's dramas, he got away with it. Tasmanian Liberal Premier Will Hodgman was re-elected to majority government this weekend. Also, it was the 40th anniversary of the degenerate Mardi Gras festival and the first after same-sex marriage passed, which was as depraved as it has always been. To discuss the week, we are joined by The Unshackled's editor-at-large, Jacob Watts. This is The Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. G'day, Tim. It's great to be back for another episode. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about this week. You know, everything from, um, from top to bottom. Uh, the world is an absolute mess, and it's great to be able to talk uh, with you today about that. Well, Australia is uh, certainly in a mess. Uh, uh, we began the week with a we got a new deputy prime minister and uh, nationals leader in Michael McCormack. He beat uh, George Christensen in a uh, ballot of uh, National Party MPs. Other uh, candidates, uh, David Gillespie and David Littleproud, uh, did not challenge. And even though they they've got a new uh, leader in uh, McCormack, they're still the shadow of uh, Barnaby Joyce. With a lot of uh, his uh, national colleagues upset that Malcolm Turnbull and the Liberals appear to uh, push him out through a, a series of leaks. And uh, Barnaby and his supporters they refuse to rule out that uh, uh, Barnaby could return to the the leadership one day. Yeah, so it was interesting. Obviously. Uh... I watched Insiders this morning, um, today being Sunday, and thereafter I watched Outsiders. And one uh, Insiders covered um, Barnaby going for a run, basically with a huge sweat patch, you know, on his chest with his black um, nicotine-stained teeth, saying that he wouldn't um, rule out the possibility of challenging again. So, you know, that adds another spanner into the works on top of him saying that he, he didn't know who the father of the child was that cost him the leadership of the National Party. So, a lot to talk about, Tim. Yeah, and a lot of people have been reacting to Michael McCormack's selection as uh, Michael Who because he he doesn't have much of a uh, profile, and of course, you know Barnaby Joyce was uh, you know su such a well-known uh, figure uh, in the uh, Australian community, uh, and a lot of the even even though this uh, you know, sex scandal and affair damaged him significantly, his national colleagues uh, still thought that he was their their best asset. They kept uh, saying that. You know, he was the, the best uh, retail politician. So it's certainly uh, big, uh, big shoes to, to fill. And uh, Malcolm McCormack, uh, they, they made sure that he got quite a number of questions from Nationals backbenchers this week. He, I thought he uh, passed the, the, the first week uh, uh, pretty well. There was, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, when you rise to the position of uh, Deputy Prime Minister, there's going to be uh, scrutiny of your um, past. And Michael McCormack, before he... Uh, became a politician was a a, a journalist. A journalist. He uh, f uh, was the editor of the, the Daily Advertiser in uh, Wagga Wagga, and uh, uh, they dug up a column of his from uh, 25 years ago, where he, uh, it, it, it was pretty strongly worded, where he, you know, blamed uh, the gay community for the spread of uh, AIDS, which was, um, you know, uh, an epidemic in uh, Australia during that time. Yeah, well, it's obviously interesting. Now, um, just it slipped my mind, Tim. How many votes did Christensen get uh, to McCormick? Well, we don't know. They did uh, the the Nationals' uh, whip, uh, Michelle Laundry, didn't uh, reveal the the vote totals, uh, which um, they're they're not obliged to. Uh, tell the the media what the the vote vote total was, and it was never leaked out to us. So uh, we're left guessing there. Well, can you imagine uh, George Christensen uh, as Deputy Prime Minister? Um, 
obviously, you know, there'd be a lot for the greeny punks to watch out for if that was the case. Uh, I would have been curious to know how many uh, votes uh, he got, yeah, whether he got the, um, uh, the, the Barnaby supporters uh, b uh, behind him, because there was a late, a late push uh, for uh, David Littleproud. Now, he's only been in Parliament, this is his first term, and there was a lot of controversy when he was catapulted uh, into Cabinet uh, from the backbenchers, uh, Agriculture Minister. But he is, uh, you know, a highly capable minister. He's impressed in uh, question time, and he is, uh, you know, highly regarded in the, the agribusiness uh, industry. So um, he, he, w he wouldn't have been a, uh, a, a bad option. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, and there's a lot of people who caught he, he was called, you know, uh, David Little Nolan uh, when he first got promoted. But yeah, he, he definitely is um, uh, highly capable. Yeah, and, and again, I saw that. It's probably the same question time that you saw, Tim. Uh, articulate, smart, switched on kind of young, youthful, yet energetic. So there's a lot of appeal there for the voters. Um, my thing was, though, like I would have loved George Christensen as deputy PM, but I just don't think he would have, you know, there would have been a bit of a tight squeeze there, you know, on the on the, on the the front benches there, you know, with big Georgie there. But um, he is obviously very capable, um, a little known, a little proud. I can't offer too much comment on, but... For me personally, I am completely and utterly sad to see Barnaby Joyce go. Barnaby was terrific. He was a terrific advocate for uh, the bush. Um, you know, he's represented New England extraordinarily well. Now, I'm terribly sad to see him go, but the media was just vulgar on Barnaby, absolutely terrible on Barnaby. Obviously, uh, you brought up, Tim, the hypocrisy with family values. Um, um, Vicky Campion being given a job in Canavan's office. All these things are circumspect. Yes, I grant that. But one has to remember that Barnaby Joyce was, uh, quote unquote, these are his words, in a loveless marriage for five years. A sexless, loveless marriage. Uh, he'd been separated from his wife and he entered into a consensual, um, well, uh, I guess you could say a relationship with another woman. Uh, this is a complete blow up. Um, we've we've basically um, got McCormack there now, um, who well he isn't exactly impressive. Um, he he isn't a great speaker, um, and I don't think he'll be a really a great leader. I think he is um, keeping the seat warm for Barnaby to come back uh, when the fire and the brimstone has cooled down. What are your thoughts on that, Tim? Well, Barnaby certainly hasn't helped himself uh, in his dealing with uh, the revelation uh, of the affair when he was supposed to be uh, on leave uh, when Malcolm Turnbull was over to the United States. He did a, a feature with Fairfax, you know, basic, basically saying, you know, I'm you know, a victim in all of this. And this and this wasn't looked on fondly by his you know, national colleagues, how he was basically, uh, you know, keeping the, the, the story uh, going. And, and of course, today, the, you know, the fact that he confessed that, um, you know, that he might not be the father. I mean, uh, I, I can't imagine how, you know, Vicky Campion would, would feel that, uh, you know, he, uh, he's, uh, you know, said that uh, about her. And, uh, you know, why, you know, even if you had that, uh, you know, suspicion if you're Barnaby dressed that, you know, it might not be yours, why would you, you know, say that to the media? I think that's, you know, uh, in my opinion, you know, sunk any any chance of his return because it's, it's really, I think, you know, be, uh, Every time the the story looked like it's it's going away, uh, you know Barnaby through you know both, uh, I've uh, the reason he's gone to Fairfax uh, both both times to basically uh, give you know more detail, which has just exacerbated this uh, further. So I think you know Barnaby, if he wants it to be you know a, a private matter, he basically needs to shut up about it. Completely agree too. 
And of course, there was a, a minor uh, reshuffle that uh, McCormack did. He uh, re-promoted uh, uh, Darren Chester to the outer uh, ministry and uh, uh, Keith uh, Pitt, uh, uh, Damien Drum and Luke Harkester were, were dumped, but uh, Cabinet was uh, re remain the same, and this is, I think, what is it, the sixth rearrangement of the uh, uh, of the ministry under uh, Turnbull's prime ministership, which is uh, which is quite ridiculous. So obviously, McCormack trying to um, you know minimal change, you know, keep uh, Canavan, uh, Little Proud, uh, Nigel uh, Scullion uh, in, in the cabinet, and you know trying to see if um, you know the uh, the divisions that have um, engulf the the nat national party uh can begin to heal yeah well it's it's going to take a lot of healing tim it's it's not going to be a quick process for sure i can guarantee you that um and it'll be interesting to see what uh barnaby joyce and tony abbott do there on the back bench because in my eyes they were both knifed you know completely and utterly uh, you know you know they were, they were backstabbed by Turnbull. Uh, one, uh, Barnaby was kept going to um, keep Turnbull's government safe there during the Section 44 debacle. And also, Turnbull used Malcolm Turnbull... Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Tony Abbott was used by Malcolm Turnbull to, uh, you know, win the election there uh, in 2015. I, I, 13. 13, 13, sorry. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what uh, Joyce and Abbott do there on the back bench. Another person agitating on the back bench is Ben Christensen. Um, so it'll be interesting uh, seeing what happens there and uh, whether there is any leadership stability uh, within our nation uh, until the next election cycle. Bill Shorten this week was involved in uh, what I would call some uh, duplicitous uh, policy uh, advocacy. Uh, he uh, told the the militant uh, CFMEU, which is uh, their um, you know leaders are you know constantly in trouble for. Uh, 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 faggish uh, behaviour. He he told them that he wanted to tear up Australia's workplace laws, which the Fair Work Act was, you know, written, uh, you know, uh, by, you know, Kevin Rudd uh, when he was Prime Minister and Julie Gillard when uh, she was Workplace Minister. So he basically wants to, you know, tear up the, uh, the workplace laws that a Labor government uh, uh, introduced. And he also, you know, can't decide if he's for the uh, Adani mine or not, because uh, businessman uh, Jeffrey Cousins this week said that you know Shorten came on a trip with him to North Queensland and said that he didn't support the the mine. But then Pauline Hanson also came out and said that uh, Bill Shorten told her that uh, he was uh, pro coal. So you know again, uh, you know what if I I think we should call him Slimy Shorten. It's uh, that that's been on display again where he's trying to have it both ways. Yeah, or, you know, he's trying to have it both ways. And this is all due to the Batman by-election happening here in Melbourne because he needs to appease CFMEU, but at the same time he also needs to um, appease the Labor left, the Green left, um, to win that uh, crucial seat in Batman there. Uh, so Turnbull is terrible on policy, but I think Shorten's even worse. Um, we see this with Adani. Adani is jobs. Adani is jobs and growth. Adani is prosperity and opportunity uh, for the working class. Um, and Labor, quite frankly, is turning their back on the working class, uh, which is disgusting. Um, Turnbull uh, saying that, you know, uh, being for Adani is great for the, uh, the blue collar redneck uh, individuals up there in Queensland. Um, and Shorten, quite frankly, is betraying his base, uh, completely and utterly betraying his base, um, leaving blue collar workers behind. Moreover, we're seeing this in Victoria with Dan Andrews uh, being complicit in the, uh, well, the sacking of 500 workers in Hazelwood, um, the near closure of the timber industry here in Victoria. Again, it's seen the Labor Party um, are turning their backs on workers. Bill Shorten, turning his back on the coal miners uh, and all their families uh, up there up north. So, 
you know, it's just more and more um, silky, slimy, slimy Bill with more lies. Two Face Bill Shorten. Uh, it was pointed out again there in question time. Um, the Labor had a go at Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, for, you know, having a fast NBN connection in his Point Piper mansion, being very classist. And then the next day, in question time, quite brilliantly, uh, Malcolm Turnbull points out um, to great effect that Bill Shorten, um, you know, is has got his hands in the pockets of millionaires, Point Piper millionaires, um, like cousins. So it shows a two-faced... Uh, you know, slimy Bill Shorten at his work once again. Uh, but the the worst thing about uh, all of this, because yeah, he's he's saying one thing in in Batman, but he's also been announcing uh, Labor's candidates uh, for for North Queensland, where he's been saying he's he's pro coal. He's getting away with it because. Uh, the Turnbull government uh, keeps being engulfed in uh, scandals and, and blunders. Obviously, the uh, Barnaby Joyce affair has dogged the government for the past uh, month now, but also uh, Jobs and Innovation Minister Michaela Cash had uh, what many said was a brain snap in Senate estimates where she was being asked about her, her new chief of staff by uh, Labor Senator Doug Cameron, and Cameron was trying to imply that he had been moved to uh, her office to comply with the, the new ministerial uh, bonking ban. And Michaela Cash, uh, she just blew up and said that, well, if you're going to imply this, I, I'm, you know, I can name uh, all the women who work in uh, Bill Shorten's office who I've heard uh, rumours about, which, um, you know, that, that was a pretty explosive thing thing to say because she's implying that you know all the women who work in Bill Shorten's office uh, having an affair uh, with him she uh at first withdrew if anyone was offended. She came back the next day to say, uh, you know, I unreservedly uh, withdraw. And she was criticised not just by uh, Labour, but also by uh, conservative commentators such as uh, Peter Credlin and Andrew Bolton. It was just another unwelcome distraction for the Turnbull government. Yeah, well, if Michaela Cash or any member of the Liberal National Party is being criticised by the likes of Peter Credlin or Andrew Bolt um, in any serious way. Um, well, not for them being, you know, um, a sellout like Shorten to the left, but for actually saying or doing something wrong. If Andrew Bolt is pulling up kind of right-wing politicians, uh, then you know they're seriously doing something wrong. Um, Michaela Cash, as well, Tony Abbott described it as a brain snap, quite frankly, um, I think that this is terrible. Um, I think that the women uh, suffer worse. It's not Bill Shorten. It's the, it's the poor women in the office there that have to put up with this uh, innuendo, uh, you know, these kind of sly, um, well, attacks from Michaela Cash. And I think it's completely and unnecessarily, uh, it's completely and um, unnecessarily, uh, it's completely... And uh, it's completely unnecessary, sorry for the stutter, guys, but it's just unneeded, completely. Um, so I reckon that she uh, needs to be reprimanded for what she said. That's unacceptable. Um, you know, we're seeing um, Canberra cascade into chaos here. Um, the Turnbull government uh, in turmoil. Um, and, well, people like Michaela Cash can't tow the party line. Uh, and this is terrible um, for the future of our nation, um, quite frankly, because it just puts Labor in a stronger position. It allows Bill Shorten to be two-faced about coal, um, and, and you're seeing swings all over the place, simply because, um, you know, uh, the, the turmoil in the Turnbull government here is allowing Labor to get away with everything. If there was more stability within the government, uh, then Bill Shorten would be really pinned down right now. And I know that uh, Bill Shorten, you know, he's had indiscretions in his uh, personal life. Uh, obviously, it's common knowledge that he cheated on his uh, first wife to be with his uh, current wife, uh, Chloe, and, you know, got her pregnant uh, during that uh, period. But, uh, you know, to, uh, as you mentioned, you know, smear the, you know, women who, you know, work for, for Bill Shorten at the moment. And it was interesting that, you know, all the, uh, you know, Canberra journalists basically said, 
I have no idea what Michaela Cash is talking about. I have heard no, um, you know, s uh, such rumors to, to basically, uh, you know, make, you know, unsubstantiated allegations up that is, you know, going, you know, way uh, too far and, you know, is, you know, d uh, is unrelated to, um, you know, what you know, we already know about, uh, you know, Bill Shorten's personal life. And yeah, basically it, it has the effect of, you know, may, uh, also having, uh, portraying, you know, Bill Shorten as, you know, being, uh, you know, a victim this week when, you know, he should be, you know, more, you know, closely scrutinized. Yeah, what it does is, I'm not sure if you'd understand this from a combat perspective or a sporting perspective, but there's, there's a saying, once you've got the foot on the throat, you keep it there, if you are to win. And what this does here is a Michaela Cash outburst lets Bill Shorten go off the hook um, for basically basically being a cheerleader for the CFMEU. We saw this. Um, being a cheerleader for brutish and thuggish CFMEU workers that threatened threatened uh, to, you know, assault, abuse, and I, I even heard kill uh, the, you know, children of non-union members. So these are primitive, uh, brutal thugs, and Bill Shorten is standing by them. So th this, this is inexcusable from Bill Shorten. He should not be allowed to get away with that at all, but Michaela Cash's brain snap um, basically, her brains basically poured out of her ears, um, has allowed Slimy Bill Shorten um, to get away, you know, with all this um, deceit. The Tasmanian state election was uh, held yesterday and uh, Tasmanian uh, Liberal Premier Will Hodgman was returned to a majority government. The Unshackled uh, covered their results as they happened uh, with an election uh, live stream, which we aim to do for all Australian elections. But uh, after the uh, result has uh, settled, I thought it would be good to do some uh, further uh, analysis. And uh, Jacob, you uh, followed the uh, results uh, last night and it was finally an election result which uh, I think both of us felt was uh, just and where the, the voters made a you know quite a well-informed decision. Well, you know the old saying, Tim, it's uh, you don't see too many people uh, thrown out of office when the economy's good. Uh, Hodgman there in Tasmania has presided over a, a vast period of economic prosperity, of jobs and of growth, and obviously Tasmanians didn't really um, want to have a go with Labor. Um, obviously some danger always when you vote in a Labor government of jobs, especially with the forestry industry. Um, don't want to risk that. Obviously Labor also want to basically ban fun uh, with getting rid of pokies out of pubs. Um, so it, it, was, it was an obvious uh, decision. Uh, that the voters of Tasmania wanted to keep tracking down the path of economic prosperity and didn't really want to uh, chart into the into the unknown of the loony Labor left. Oh, you left out the Greens there because under uh, Tasmania's Hair Clark electoral system, uh, it was only possible that Labor could uh, govern after this election with uh, Green support. And the, the last uh, Tasmanian government was a Labor-Greens coalition, which was a disaster for the, the, the state's economy. And yes, the voters of Tasmania, they, they did have a, a long memory. And it's not always the case that in good uh, economic times, the, the government is returned. I mean, look what happened to the Howard government in uh, 2007 and uh, over in New Zealand last year, um, enough people voted for Jacinda Ardern and Labor to uh, have, have her uh, replace the uh, uh, nine-year-old national government, which had overseen the uh, economic recovery uh, in that nation. But yeah, the, it, uh, like, I met, like I mentioned and why I was so pleased with the result is because 
the uh, the voters, they didn't fall for the trap of being, well, you know, it's good at the moment, um, you know, let's, you know, risk it with, like, you know, our government which wants to, to do more things. They thought, no, let's not, um, you know, flirt with our form, uh, you know, let, let's keep going with the winning team. Well, for sure, Tim. But I, I thought what you did then was pick out the exceptions to the rule. It's a much like what um, feminists do, Tim. There's obviously rules that govern our society, but there's exceptions to them. Obviously, Howard um, and the Nationals being turfed out was, was one of those. Um, but but I, I'll be honest with you, I was not following it too closely. I watched Sky News' coverage. I watched the Unshackled's coverage, which was, you know, really good. Um but I haven't. I wasn't following Tasmania awfully closely. I was thinking, Tim, personally, if you went to Tasmania and you did some live coverage there, you might come back with two heads, twice the wisdom, twice the knowledge. Oh, that's such a lame joke. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people uh, with state elections, they wonder if there's federal uh, implications. Uh, I think in, in this state election, there is absolutely zero. It was completely on uh, state issues. Uh, Will Hodgman obviously made the wide de wise decision to make sure that Malcolm Turnbull uh, was nowhere uh, to be seen. And, he, and he's pretty much a, you know, he, he was able to carry the campaign, you know, uh, by himself. He, you know, presents, uh, you know, very well, very authoritative and, and he, he was able to say, you know, this is what we've done with Tasmania over the past four years. Uh, you know, we've been a pretty stable government, you know, re-elect me to do the, the, the same job. And, uh, you know, the, the rabble uh, at, the, at the federal level is in complete contrast to the Tasmanian Liberal Party. Well, I think that Tasmania's geographical isolation um, probably helps it in that aspect where... Uh, the, the issues of the mainland um, don't affect Tasmania as much. So it is more on state issues, which obviously helped Hodgman there. Um, so that, that was a key. Um, but distance from Turnbull is good. Turnbull, everything he touches turns to shit. Quite frankly, it does. So it was a very wise move from Will Hodgman uh, to... Uh, basically, keep um, turn the boats back, keep uh, uh, Malcolm out of there. Uh, it was a very good move. One of the interesting things that I found out was the whole gun lobby debacle. Now, I'm all for shooters' rights, don't get me wrong, but what was this, this leak about some communication... Uh, with the gun lobby and the Liberal Party. Um, could you fill us in on that, Tim? Uh, it, was, it was basically just a minor tweak with Category C of uh, fi uh, firearms, which would allow you know farmers uh, easier yeah. access to um, some weapons for um, pest control. And it, it was such a giant beat-up. And uh, I heard from some people that, oh, the Tasmanian Liberal Party, they've, they've thrown the election away with, uh, with, with, with this policy. But in the end, uh, like the, the result, you know, was, uh, as the, the polls, uh, predicted. So I, I, yeah, I, I think that was, you know, just, uh, the, uh, the media, you know, getting swept up in usual, you know, anti-gun, uh, hysteria and, uh, you know, the vote Voters, I think, yeah. uh, saw through it. A big beat up by the ABC, the Australian Bolshevik uh, Corporation, as I like to call them. Um, so you, you, you can only really take that with a grain of salt. And uh, of course, uh, the the Greens uh, collapsed in that state. I mean, they're uh, at the moment only one of their members is returned their leader, Cassie uh, O'Connor, and uh, uh, Greens and uh, also Labor leader Rebecca White uh, complained about the uh, the pokies money and basically, you know, claimed that uh, the election uh, had been uh, bought. So, you know, they, uh, uh, their line was, you know, we would have done better if it wasn't for, you know, those, um, you know dam of uh, you know uh, pokies uh, money which uh, which of course is uh, you know a, a huge you know furphy I mean you have to reflect on uh, yeah. your own performance yeah well uh, it's just general labor philosophy all around uh, they don't want people to have a beer they want you know obviously the alco pops tax rub 
Um, they don't want people to smoke. Um, you know, they want to put up the taxes on that. And they don't want people to gamble, have a punt, have some fun. So obviously Labor didn't really have too much to run on, um, and, and it was shown here. But I am thankful to God Almighty that there is not a coalition between the Greens and the Labor Party in Tasmania because it would have killed the forestry industry. It would have. There's prospects of a casino being built there in Tasmania as well, I've heard, I've read. Uh, that would have probably been done away with as well. Uh, so the unholy uh, coalition between basically communists and socialists there in Tasmania did not come into fruition, and I am very happy. And I think that Will Hodgman's government will be doing terrific, but it's also our job at the Unshackled to hold him to account. Obviously, there's a lot of policy promises. Uh, we have to hold him to account as well. And of course, it was the beginning of a bumper election year in Australia in uh, two weeks' time. That's the uh, South Australian uh, state election, which of course is that three-way contest between uh, Labor, Liberal and Nick Xenophon. And of course, the, the Batman uh, by-election as well in uh, inner Melbourne, where it looks like currently the, the Greens are imploding with uh, the party turning against their, their candidate who's uh, complaining about her um, you know, quality of life living in... Of, of, a street where the homes are worth $2 million. It is a terribly hard life um, living in a $3 million home. Um, personally, you know, I would would never stoop below $3.5 million. Uh, but you know, it's, it's obviously ridiculous. We've got um, Champagne Socialists in Batman um, versus Chardonnay sh Socialists. Uh, there is no right-wing alternative uh, for anyone there. It doesn't really matter. It's Batman. The Liberal Party would probably get about 10 12% of the vote if they were to run a candidate. So um, basically the inner cities are, you know, like, like the St. St. Petersburg Soviet. They're just little groups of workers and collectives, like, all jammed on top of each other, and they just vote for more doll, more doll, more doll. Um, you know, so there is really no hope, but I can only hope for the sake of the sanity of all South Australians that Jay Weatherall gets thrown out because power prices in South Australia are the highest in the entire world. It is just ridiculous. Um, so it will be interesting to see. Obviously, the Unshackled again will be covering uh, the South Australian election. It is a really crucial election. Uh, if there are any South Australians, uh, here um, that obviously don't want higher and higher power prices, that want some economic prosperity, get there, get out and campaign um, for the Liberal Party or for, you know, or Xenophon or anyone who represents you. But I think that it is very much time to get rid of Jay Weatherall and we will be covering that. Another event that occurred last night was the uh, Sydney Gay and Lesbian uh, Mardi Gras. Now, this was heavily promoted because it was the, the 40th anniversary and it was the, the first after uh, same-sex marriage. And uh, all the uh, major corporations uh, promoted it uh, heavily. All the major parties were there. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Gladys Berejiklian uh, were there. And uh, uh, even the, the ABC thought it uh, appropriate to promote it to... Uh, uh, children and uh, Westfield, they also had a, a drag show at their, their shopping centre. Now, the Unshackled has uh, always taken a, a strong stand against the, the Mardi Gras. We've uh, last year and this year called for it to be banned. Now, that's not an opinion shared by all editors uh, at the Unshackled. It's one uh, shared, shared by me because it is an event that, you know, consistently has violated, you know, public uh, decency uh, laws. It's looking at this uh, objectively. I mean, if you if you look at this, uh, if it was say you know a you know a, an event celebrating you know uh, heterosexual sexuality, like imagine if you know a bunch of straight men decided to you know celebrate that they you know liked you know girls in bikinis and that the the feminist lobby you know would say that you know it, it was objectifying women and uh, you know would, would say you know perpetuates uh, rape culture and uh, domestic violence, but because you know it's uh, you know it's an event you know. Uh, 
about a you know an oppressed minority you know victim group it's given a free pass to basically you know what uh, what is the normal standard acceptable behavior in public well obviously there are public decency laws now i'm not sure is it tim let's just say hypothetically if you or i walk down the street in in our underwear you know in our jocks what would happen to us in a normal situation, do, do you know? Oh, well, there, there'd certainly be a lot, a lot of people who would feel, you know, uncomfortable thinking, you know, what, 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 what on earth? Um, uh, 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 the, sorry. Do, do you know if we'd be breaking any laws? Um, or maybe the the police. Well, certainly if we were making you know sexually suggestive, um, you know, uh, movements, um, you know that uh, that would certainly be viewed as you know inappropriate by uh, the public. And you know if the the police were around, they'd maybe want to have a word. So, but, but you have yeah. I, I make my biggest effort not to watch the Mardi Gras or not to pay attention to it at all. But, you know, I have seen, obviously, the 30-second cuts on SBS, ABC, what have you, and they're doing some really wild stuff. I, I mean, it's not just like walking down the street, hoorah, I'm gay. They're doing some really wild stuff, you know. It's just out of this world. Um, now, I've got no problem with them celebrating their sexuality, um, but I think, ideally, um, there should be a private arena hired um, or there should be more of an emphasis on enforcing decency. Um, I think some of the clothing is awfully provocative. Um, I think some of the behaviour is degenerate. Um, but I, I think that our gay and lesbian community should be allowed to celebrate their sexuality to the same extent. But ideally, I'd like to see that done in a private arena. Um, because it, it disrupts commerce, it disrupts travel. You know, it pretty much um, puts part of Sydney to a stop. Um, but again, I, I'm not for, for banning, but I'm for relocating uh, to a venue, uh, to a private venue. Um, not because I just think that it is, you, you can't really be having, you know, a party in the middle of the street. Um, no one should really have the privilege to have uh, a glittered up party in the middle of the street. Now, whether the, if they're celebrating uh, heterosexual or homosexual behaviour, whether they're vegans or whether they are vegetarians or whatever their plight is, I just really don't think stopping the main street to, to celebrate um, your way of life uh, is necessary um, for, for that amount of time. Um, that's, that's just my take on it. Um, you know, or if you are to protest, to do it in an area, uh, you know, that's that's not a vital economic point. But I understand the. But what are they protesting for? That's that's the question I have, and I don't mean to ramble. They've got you've got equal rights under the law if you're gay. What's the point of protesting? That, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, there's always something more to uh, complain about. In fact, I did uh, a story uh, late last year. There's this poster going around saying that, you know, after uh, equal marriage, these are all the uh, other things that uh, uh, we, uh, we can campaign on. So, yeah, you should know by now that, um, you know, the, the left uh, are never satisfied with... Uh, with anything. I, I certainly agree that it should be confined to, say, a private stadium, and it should definitely have an, an age restriction on it to, to 18 plus. I mean, that ABC you know, ad was, was just, uh, you know, disgusting. Like, how can anyone think it's, you know, an appropriate uh, event for, for children? Certainly, I don't think it is. Um, I think that this event... Uh may could be allowed to go ahead if there were stringent regulations on things now at the moment it's being promoted uh, to children as well which which I find disturbing really um, and th that's a problem so if it's going to go ahead I think it should be allowed to go ahead I'm not in favor of banning it I'm all for freedom of association I just don't want police dollars army dollars any taxpayer dollars going to fund this at all. If it's private companies, 
if it's in a private hired stadium and they're having a big party, a big extravaganza, go for it. I'd love you to. But I just think that the, the fact that it's being promoted to children, the fact that taxpayer dollars are being used, and the fact that there is some indecent and uh, degenerate uh, behaviour going on in the main street that is funded by taxpayer dollars, that is what I find disturbing. Not necessarily the, the sexuality aspect um, or the fact that they want to celebrate it. I just think that it also is a bad representation on gay people. Now, you know, obviously, I've wor I've had a man I've uh, worked with uh, gay people, and they generally are just like yeah, um, well, me or anyone else. But the different sexuality. Now, to say that all gay people are like the the, the fringes at Mardi Gras is ridiculous, and it, it, I think it can also stem a lot of homophobia as well. I know what I've just said over the past five minutes might not be too politically correct. But that's what we're here for at The Unshackled, is breaking the chains of control, saying what needs to be said. Um, I just think that it's not a great representation on the community either. Um, that's just my view on things. And obviously, you can take me to, to bits in the comment section if you want. And Australia didn't vote yes to a display such as this. They, they voted yes to same-sex marriage. They didn't, you know, sign a blank check for, you know, like, uh, you know, gay and lesbian people to carry on in, you know, whatever, you know, manner of, uh, of, of they want. I mean, uh, you know, we've, like, Obvious, like in my in my opinion, the you know what's on display at the the Mardi Gras, the you know over you know sexual uh, you know uh, display and uh, you know uh, base, uh, basically you know what is you know a lot of the time promoting um, promiscuity. I mean that in my view is a lot worse than uh, you know what what is actually a conservative you know action of like you know two you know gay people getting married. Yeah, well, I think that. Um, throughout all aspects of society, uh, monogamy should be encouraged um, and sexual exclu exclusivity as well I within a couple. Um, now, this sexual revolution of the 1960s has basically spread uh, a whole raft of sexually transmitted diseases around. Um, it leaves people also with a feeling of emptiness, uh, with a feeling of un being unfulfilled. So I think whether it is within the heterosexual or the homosexual community, uh, we need to encourage um, monogamy, uh, respectful relationships, uh, not those uh, pushed by the left, of course, but respectful relationships um, and, and just decency, compassion, respect. Uh, and I think all these things uh, are, are missing out on the Mardi Gras there because obviously it's not inspired by classical Judeo-Christian thought, is it? It's its own beast, and that's what's so dangerous about it. Yeah, and there's certainly a lot of um, attacks on religion uh, during uh, uh, that, that event. Uh, but it, it's going to, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to, you know, increase our, you know, campaign against it because, you know, it's it's basically a, a bipartisan event now. I mentioned that, you know, Malcolm Turnbull and Gladys Berejiklian were there last night. You know, Liberal Party uh, had a it used float. To be fringe. It used to be very fringe, didn't it, Tim? Remember how fringe it was under Howard? And now how mainstream is it now? That's that's how far the culture is shifting. Politics is downstream from culture, and that's why we must keep our culture firm and upright. And that's what we, we that's what we try and do here. And that's why we speak up against it, really. Uh, but Bar um, Berejiklian, Turnbull was there. You know, it's it, it's completely bipartisan. Uh, well, well, certainly it's. Oh, uh, what we well, what we tried to avoid last night it, it's it certainly uh, makes you uh, despair quite a bit for uh, the future of our country which is oh, that's a sad note to end on um, oh, it was it was certainly a uh, a busy or turbulent uh, political week uh, uh, we had or well, at least we had the the silver lining at the end of the week with the, the Tasmanian uh, election results so thank you uh, Jacob for for coming on uh, once again and uh, offering your thoughts yeah, no worries, Tim. Uh, it was my pleasure. 
All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Following on from our discussion about the problems with the Mardi Gras, our senior editor, Damien Ferry, was at St Mary's Cathedral in Sydney on Saturday night, which is near the Mardi Gras parade, to take part in the Stalwart Bastion, which aims to protect the cathedral from vandalism throughout the night and also to take a stand against the degenerate nature of the event. He will be releasing video footage in the upcoming days, so stay tuned for that. And as we mentioned in our Tasmanian election roundup, we'll be having another live stream on Saturday the 17th of March for the South Australian election and the Batman by-election. We are constantly looking at ways to improve the quality of our live stream, so our next one will be uh, bigger and better. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.